so you have three things, right? You have the sun, the earth, and the moon. Uh, and uh, the moon orbits around the earth, and the earth and the moon together orbit around the sun. So, you know, uh, the sun, right, just like anything else, uh, when it shines on something, it casts a shadow. Uh, so very simply, uh, a lunar eclipse is when uh, the moon passes through the shadow cast by the earth, and a solar eclipse is when the earth passes through the shadow cast by the moon. I would say uh, a lunar eclipse almost certainly not. Uh, the, the only way it would do that is uh, if people sort of psychologically were attuned to the moon being there. But the moon, of course, people are used to the moon being different brightnesses on different days. So I think, you know, there's been some studies that a solar eclipse can be a bit disorienting for birds and that kind of thing, that, that uh, you know, where it seems like night, but it's the middle of the day. Um, and, but those, it, obviously those effects would be very short term. A lunar eclipse, I think most people won't even notice. Uh, well, that happens to be a happy coincidence. So it just so happens that tonight, uh, not tonight, on Friday night, when you look up in the sky and you're looking at the eclipse, uh, uh, not that far away uh, will, be, uh, will be Mars and will be quite bright. And so we're fortunate in that sense. Um, uh, but in terms of why it's happening now, it's pretty much a coincidence that the orbit of Mars and the orbit of uh, uh, and the, the, the eclipse happen to line up. You know, people really have, I guess, a deep-seated need to feel like there's some structure, uh, you know, something beyond just sort of random chance guiding events. And, uh, and of course, there's all the whole historical baggage where people used to really believe this back before they knew, you know, that the, the, the moon was a big rock and all those kinds of things. So, so now that we know what, uh, what they are, uh, you know, it's, it becomes a little bit harder to believe all those things, but I think, you know, those traditional beliefs persist. And of course, you know, once you don't believe that anymore, you have to decide what, what, what you do believe. And, uh, you know, I think people have other choices, but, uh, but uh, you know, people, it, I think it's, it, the need is sort of more psychological than it has anything to do with what's really going on in the world. I, I think it just has to do with the sort of relative sizes of things that, uh, um, it, you know, it's sort of the same reason that the sky is normally blue, but at sunset it turns red, right? It's a matter of uh, uh, how light gets refracted in the atmosphere, and in this case it has to do with the atmosphere of the Earth, right? And so uh, when the moon is completely inside the shadow of the Earth, it, you basically can't see it. But when it's on the edges, uh, the light that gets through, you know, will be, will be Will be a reddish hue because uh, because that light gets reflected less than the, the blue frequencies, and so that it, it it's the same reason. You know, the, it, it'll look red for the same reason sunsets. Uh, here at Vitz, uh, most of us are, are are not doing planetary astronomy. We're looking at things outside of our solar system. Uh, so uh, the, uh, a lot of the research I do, for example, is uh, uh, in uh, galaxies that are uh, millions of light years away from from our galaxy, you know, uh, in which our solar system resides. And inside of those, there are uh, black holes that are uh, billions of times the mass of our sun, and they emit these hugely powerful jets uh, that uh, that are pointed straight at the Earth. And, you know, move very quickly and, and generate a lot of power, and uh, and so I, I find that fascinating. You can use that as a probe of cosmology and a probe of uh, basically the uh, how the universe came to be in its present form. And so, you know, I think those are very exciting.